So welcome to the last presentation on imaging anatomy of the pharynx. And in this presentation, we're going to talk about the anatomy of the hypopharynx. The hypopharynx is the lowest part of the pharynx, extending from the tip of the epiglottis. And once again, the epiglottis is not part of the pharynx, it is part of the larynx, extending from the tip and the posterior surface of the epiglottis to the inferior surface of the cricoid. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Cricoid, cricoid, whatever, you know what I mean. Posteriorly and located posteriorly of the larynx. And the hypopharynx serves as a passageway for food to the esophagus. The hypopharynx is probably the most difficult one of um, the components of the pharynx. It is actually quite small, quite dense, and from an anatomical point of view, strongly related with the larynx lying anteriorly of it. So in a lot of textbooks or articles, you see that the anatomy of the hypopharynx and the larynx are often discussed together because that kind of makes sense to do from an anatomical point of view, despite the fact that they belong to different components of the head and neck or different compartments. Me personally, I don't like to do stuff that makes sense. And it's an attitude that explains a lot of my decisions in my personal and private life. But enough about that. Let's focus on the hypopharynx and discuss it separately from laryngeal anatomy. And I'm going to make something about laryngeal anatomy for a future presentation. Um, but that's work in progress. Let's start with defining the borders of the hypopharynx. So what are the borders of the hypopharynx? As already said, the superior border is the tip of the epiglottis, the epiglottis belonging to the larynx, and the inferior border is the inferior surface of the cricoid cartilage. And here this arrow helps you see it because it's located quite inferiorly on this image as well. The posterior border is formed by the posterior hypopharyngeal wall. The anterior border is formed by the laryngeal inlet, so basically the opening from the hypopharynx to the larynx, and this kind of explains why laryngeal and hypopharyngeal anatomy are often discussed together. And then the lateral borders are formed by the piriform recess, which are located on both sides of the larynx. So we see the piriform sinuses. Uh, says here recess, correct name is sinus. So we see them here located on both sides of the larynx. Um, the hypopharynx has three subsides. As already said, we have the pyriform sinuses. We have the posterior wall of the hypopharynx. And, and this is a quite difficult one to, to actually visualize. We also have the postcricoid region, which is the anterior mucosa located posteriorly of the cricoid. So basically, if you look at the middle image over here, the postcricoid region is this small area of mucosa located along the cricoid cartilage, but not the posterior mucosa, only the anterior mucosa. Okay, I'm going to illustrate that in a bit more detail later. Let's start with the piriform sinus, which is no doubt the most important structure of the hypopharynx uh, when it comes to oncological imaging, because most hypopharyngeal carcinomas originate in the piriform sinus. So these are uh, pear-shaped recesses located on both sides of the laryngeal inlet. So the air filled structure in the middle, that's not the hypopharynx, that's the larynx, important distinction. And there are important areas from a clinical point of view, because on the one hand, the pyriform sinuses are areas where you frequently get foreign body impaction. Uh, and as already said, they are also an important site for the development of hypopharyngeal carcinomas. Now, this is an image of the border of the laryngeal inlet as seen by a laryngoscope. And yeah, it's possible that you don't recognize anything on these images, so let's help you. I'm showing you this because it will help you understand what you see in your images. Over here, we see the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis, so basically the back surface of the epiglottis. And the epiglottis can, um, when we swallow, actually tilts 
uh, inferiorly to close the laryngeal inlet uh, so we don't aspirate uh, and no food or drinks enter the larynx. Anyways, enough of that. This is the laryngeal surface of the epiglottis and here in the depth we can see the vocal cords and the part of the glottis located underneath it is called the subglottis, also visible here. Then these somewhat, yeah, uh, how should we describe this um, uh, these structures, I'm going to call them, because I can't find a suitable uh, adjective in English, nothing pops to mind, uh, are the arytenoid cartilages covered by mucosa, of course, and we have a mucosal fold going from the arytenoid cartilages to the um, uh, pharyngeal wall called the or the wall of the epiglottis called the ariepiglottic fold. Now, posteriorly, we find the hypopharynx and located in the depth is the entrance to the esophagus. And these recesses over here, located on both sides of the ariepiglottic fold or the pyriform recesses. With all this in mind, let's take another look at our images and try to visualize all these structures. So once again, we see the laryngeal inlet over here with the pyriform recesses or pyriform sinuses located on both sides. The medial wall, of the pyriform sinuses is, full, is formed by the ariepiglottic fold. So the mucosal fold connecting the arytenoid cartilages uh, with the epiglottis and the lateral wall is for, formed by thyroid cartilage. If you look at a magnified coronal image, this here is one, this is the right pyriform sinus. This here is arytenoid cartilage. Over here we see the hyoid bone, and this is the ariepiglottic fold forming the medial wall uh, of the pyriform sinus, and the lateral wall is formed inferiorly by thyroid cartilage, and then we have a thin membrane connecting thyroid cartilage with the hyoid bo bone, and this is called the thyrohyoid membrane. This is very thin and also allows the passage of certain neurovascular structures, including the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Now, the, hypo, um, the pyriform sinus is, as said, the most frequent site for hypopharyngeal carcinomas. These often present late. Uh, when they are discovered, there is often advanced submucosal spread, which can extend into the larynx or even the esophagus. And because this region has a rich lymphatic uh, supply, there are often lymph node metastases, as we can also see in this patient over here. And from a clinical point of view, or from a radiological point of view, in advanced cases, it can become quite difficult to make the distinction between a hypopharyngeal tumor that has spread into the larynx or a laryngeal tumor that has spread into the hypopharynx. I will talk more about that uh, in a future presentation on staging of head and neck pharyngeal and laryngeal tumors. Then we have the next subsite, the posterior pharyngeal wall. This is basically the mucosa-lined back wall of the hypopharynx. Here we see the cricoid and the inferior surface of the cricoid is basically the inferior border of the hypopharynx. Here we have the, the superior border formed by the or indicated by the tip of the epiglottis. And then the back is the posterior pharyngeal wall. What do we find there? Constrictor muscle, uh, as we mostly find in the posterior pharyngeal wall. In this case, it's going to be probably um, parts of the middle and inferior constrictor walls. And behind it, we have the retropharyngeal space, prevertebral muscles, and vertebra. So um, a tumor located in the posterior pharyngeal wall will tend to invade these underlying spaces. Uh, we also have the postcricoid region and this is a difficult region to understand and visualize. I also indicated here the ariepiglottic fold, which you can see above the cricoid in this patient. And what is the postcricoid region? Well, it's a region located behind the cricoid. It's basically the mucosa behind the cricoid, but not all mucosa, the anterior mucosa, because the posterior belongs to the posterior hypopharyngeal wall. Why do we make this distinction? It is made for oncological purposes, 
because tumors that originate from the postcricoid region behave different than tumors originating from the posterior hypopharyngeal wall, despite the fact that it is often difficult to make the distinction in this very small region. So it is located in front of the hypopharyngeal lumen and the mucosa lying the posterior hypopharyngeal wall. And inferiorly, this is continuous with the upper esophagus. So tumors in this region will often spread into the cervical esophagus. This is a magnified axial image. Here we see the cricoid. And here we see the posterior pharyngeal wall. And this is then the anterior mucosa, posteriorly of the cricoid. This is the postcricoid region. Now, basically, we infer the location, right? Because this just blends. The mucosa of the postcricoid region and the posterior hypopharyngeal wall, they're just opposed. They just lie immediately on top of each other. So we can't really see the difference between the two. Even when we do high resolution MRI images, which uh, I'm showing you an example of, this is a very high resolution image showing you the cricoid. This is the posterior cricoid arytenoid muscle. And then we have a very thin line of mucosa lining that. That's the postcricoid region. And posteriorly of that, we have the posterior, posterior hypopharyngeal wall. If you would scroll down a little bit, you will stumble upon the cervical esophagus. OK. From a practical point of view, well, it's important that you realize that this distinction exists and was made for oncological purposes. But if you encounter a tumor in this region, it will always be difficult to make a distinction between a tumor originating from the anterior mucosa or the posterior mucosa. Here we see the cricoid. We see a mass involving the hypopharynx and the postcricoid region. But is it really, did the tumor really originate from the anterior mucosa? always difficult sometimes very subjective opinions can differ in this case i would say no and why is that because i would assume that a tumor originating from the anterior mucosa would involve all the mucosa and basically be um, situated along the entire back of the cricoid this is not the case here here we see a tumor that in my opinion when looking at the way this tumor has grown probably originated somewhere along the left side of the posterior hypopharyngeal wall. It kind of makes sense. So that was my interpretation of this case, but I admit that it can be extremely difficult. And very important is also to look for the extension of the tumor in other spaces, or in this case, in the upper esophagus. Okay, this concludes my presentations on pharyngeal anatomy. I said a lot about pharyngeal anatomy. Let's summarize. What do I want you to remember of these when you combine them? Presentations uh, probably totaling almost two hours on pharyngeal anatomy. I hope that if you, if you watched all of these, that you're quickly able to recognize all the important structures of the nasopharynx, that you immediately recognize that this is a nasopharynx because we see here the typical torus tubarius, here the impressions caused by the longus capiti or collie muscles, and that you see or immediately recognize a Rosenmuller's fossa located posteriorly of the torus tubarius and the predilection site for nasopharyngeal carcinomas. I hope that when you look at the level of the oropharynx, that you immediately recognize the components of the tonsillar fossa. We see here the uvula, which is also part of the oropharynx. We see here the tonsillar, uh, the palatine tonsils, and we see the anterior and posterior tonsillar pillars formed by the palatoglossus and palatopharyngeus muscles, respectively. We even see the, lat the superior constrictor muscle, which forms the lateral wall of the tonsillar fossa and also continues as the posterior pharyngeal wall. Also remember that the tongue base is part of the oropharynx and not of the oral cavity. We also have seen that there is a peritonsillar space and this is the location for peritonsillar 
abscesses. When it comes to the hypopharynx, you will at a glance recognize now the pyriform sinuses located laterally or posterolaterally of the laryngeal inlet. So this is the larynx. And at the level of the cricoid, know, know that this is a quite complex region because you find two subsites here. You find the postcricoid region, which is the anterior mucosa of the located behind the cricoid, but also part of the posterior pharyngeal wall, which is the posterior mucosa in this region. Be able to make a quick distinction between things you shouldn't pathologize, like nasopharyngeal adenoid hypertrophy in the nasopharynx, um, and which is most frequent in children, from a nasopharyngeal carcinoma, as you can see over here, which will be asymmetrical and generally seen in older patients. The same applies to the oropharynx, where you should make a distinction between benign palatine tonsil hypertrophy, which is most pronounced in children uh, and adolescents, but will decrease with increasing age. And do not mistake that for oropharyngeal carcinomas, which will be seen in older patients, smokers, drinkers, and will be asymmetrical. The same is true for the lingual tonsils, where you shouldn't mistake a lingual tonsil hypertrophy seen in children with a tongue-based carcinoma. Okay, and this concludes my presentation on imaging anatomy of the pharynx. I use several references for making this presentation. It's not that I'm so knowledgeable uh, out of my own. I have to look a lot of things up. I continuously learn new things by making these presentations. And I learned a lot from this excellent reference article on anatomy of the pharynx and cervical esophagus, and I recommend it greatly. Published at Neuroimaging Clinics of North America in 2022 by colleagues Dr. Karawas Manoglu and Dr. Osgen, uh, both working in Chicago. No, one of them working um, in Ankara, Turkey, and the other one working at the University of Illinois Hospital in Chicago. Um, doctor or Professor Osgen was very nice to send me a copy of this article because I had no access to neuroimaging clinics of North America. Really appreciate this, can't thank you enough because it's a beautiful article, it's a very helpful article. There are a lot of others out there. Use the references in this article to deepen your knowledge. I recommend it greatly. And I would like to thank once again the authors both for publishing this excellent article and sharing it with me. So that concludes my presentations on imaging of the pharynx. Any questions, comments or feedback, leave a comment, question or some feedback in the comment section or send me an email neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. I am way behind on replying to my emails. My apologies for that. I do my best to reply to everyone. So if you haven't received the reply, even though you wrote me an email, it will probably come. Just be patient. So every now and every now and then I make some time to go to all those emails and actually reply to all of them. So thank you very much for watching.